Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I begin, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. For millennia, this land has been a place of learning for the Musqueam people who have passed their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next on this site, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be here. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Nancy Lee, Assistant Professor at the UBC Creative Writing Program, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the program and on behalf of our chair, Alex Oleen, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. I'm honored to be hosting today's author Q&A with esteemed scholar and award-winning author, editor, and activist, Goge, you're going to help me with your last name? Wadiyama. Wadiyama. Yeah. This past weekend, he has been a guest of the Afrocentrism Conference, whose goal is to decolonize academia and to subvert Western ways of knowing and learning and celebrate black scholarship. And today, we have students here from our undergraduate and graduate creative writing programs, also our optional residency MFA. I'm just going to wave to the camera because <laughs> they're watching us via video. Um, and really what we'd like to do is give students the opportunity to ask questions. I will get the conversation started, but um, for those of you who are here and hoping to ask a question, I'm hoping you're going to get your questions ready now so that when I turn to the room, there'll be many, many hands going up at the same time. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce our esteemed writer. How does one introduce one of Africa's greatest living writers? I'd like to begin with a quote from The Guardian. He believes in the imagination. Perhaps that seems obvious for the decorated Kenyan novelist, scholar, and playwright who's been publishing for over 50 years. But imagination and all art for him is not just a form of creativity, it's a form of resistance. In 1962, Goge burst onto the literary scene in East Africa with his first major play, The Black Hermit at the National Theatre in Kampala, Uganda, as part of a celebration of Uganda's independence. Since then, he has written more than 40 published works. I, I think you've lost count, perhaps. <laughs> In, including novels, short stories, essays, memoirs, social criticism, writing for children, and plays. In 2016, he was awarded Korea's Park Yong mi Prize, one of the world's richest and most prestigious literary awards. In 2018, he earned the Republic of Cameroon's Grand Prix des Mécènes. Just earlier this year, he won the Eric Maria Remark Peace Prize, and he is a perennial favorite for the Nobel Prize for Literature. His recent books include Birth of a Dreamweaver, a memoir of a writer's awakening, Secure the Base, a collection of lectures and essays, In the House of the Interpreter, about his teenage years during the Mama Rebellion, and the novel Wizard of the Crow, which Book Forum described as an epic burlesque of a sick, lumbering state and a praise song to the manifold forms of African resistance, as clear a view of Africa as we are likely to get. He serves as Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of California, Irvine. Please welcome Goge Wadiamo. Yeah, I'll say correct. <laughs> Thank you. 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 So when some, you know, some library has problem in knowing how to classify me. Yes. But as Yomo, <laughs> or as Goge, or as Wa, or... And so some, Wa some, means some, us. Some building of Chinese or Vietnamese, so I get some calls, you know. Yes. The Wa. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that you're not Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> so and Goge is really my real name. Goge, and is Goge your given name, or your, it's your given name, not your... Do you have a family name? If your, if, your, if your father's name is Chiyomo... It's not my family name, it's just my father's name. It's your father's name. Then I am, my name is Gogi, just as Theo is my father's name. Yes. 
then between me we establish a relationship. Yes. I'm Goge, son of the Ama. Meaning, if there are other, other Goges, we can distinguish them by their by different their relationships. Yeah. Either by their fathers or their mothers. Ah. In, for instance, when I was growing up, because uh, I grew up in, um, uh, I had four mothers and one father. Okay. And uh, my mother is my biological mother was the third. So we used to distinguish my different siblings. Yes. Not by their relations to our father, Theoma. Yeah. But in relation to their to your to our different mothers, you know. So we have four mothers. We belong to different biological mothers. Yes. So I'll be Gogewa Ajiko. That's my mother, not Gogo Anion. And someone will be seven years after. In relation to their mother. Yes. Okay. It's only when I went to school first time. And they asked me, what's your name? And I said, wow, <laughs> <laughs> In the way I mean, I mean, it was natural to me. Yeah. You know, uh, he said, and what is your father's name? Theoma. Yeah. So he wrote down, oh, uh, <laughs> So when it was when you went to school that they named you by your father's lineage? Yes, I was, otherwise I was going about my mother, Wajiko. And then for and then later on. Later I go to church and say, Oh, you must have, have a European name. Well, yeah. they call it what is your name. So uh, I got James. James, yes. Then I, James, I got James. I became James Googie. Then I then I I said later I said to myself, wait a minute, what I do? Uh, I've lost my father to James or something, somewhere. I lost my mother, she knows in my name system, and I lost my father. Yeah. So I tried to put my father in. So I became James T. Goge. <laughs> I mean, James Young Goge. And then, many years later, uh, I think I was in Akira, I think. I was reading about the enslavement of Africa. And how the apart from branding, you know, African white branded, literally like you brand cattle at the mark of ownership. But also when they came across to the plantation, they were given, mm. they lost their name and were given a name for the plantation owner. So the plantation was owned by Brown. They became Browns, you mean? Owned uh, by Brown. Owned by Brown, and so on. Uh, then, it, wait a minute. But this is what Christianity is doing to us with its names. They are branding us, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know. Uh, so for me, getting rid of James was absolutely important for me. I joke that when I realize this, I put James in an envelope. I know you don't say things by envelopes, <laughs> but you know, there is a, you put in an envelope, then you write the return to sender. Yes. <laughs> right? I, uh, and, but when you, when you returned James to sender, you had already written, you had already published two books. Yes, I have republished. My first two books, you know, Weep Not Child, uh, the River, the River, Weep Not Child and The River Between, and A Grain of Wheat, and uh, James Gogi. And I'm quite well known as James Gogi. Around uh, the world? Yes. So when I get to my, when I realized this, and I wanted to, no, I can't have this, I can't accept being branded anymore, you know. Uh, it was a problem because my publishers were saying, look, you're very well known as, as James Gogi. It's like you're going to lose a market or something, yeah. you know. 
Uh, I said, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, right? So if you transition, what if you transition to go wide, you know, you sometimes they would put uh, go here by itself, sometimes you do lots of strange things, yeah. but in the end, we are able to uh, get to go wide, you know, in all my books, including the ones I had published and at James Gogi. Yeah. So now all of them, from River Between, you know, Child, A Dream of Wheat, Petal of the Blood, and the ones that I think are all under my name, which is Gogi, one year. The most beautiful thing, they are all without the brand. They've been branded by James, yeah. Yes. yeah. James has gone forever. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd like Except to... Except there's a few who still cling. <laughs> there are a few, oh, there are a few there places are, on the internet where it's still cling to you. There are a few who still cling No, you are James. <laughs> <laughs> who? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about what I think um, for many has become a defining incident in your life. In 1978, you were arrested in the middle of the night and held without trial in a maximum security prison. Can you tell us what you were arrested for? The same thing, actually. Names. Uh, what do I mean by this? See, names. Uh, a name is like a language. You know, because language is a naming system. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was, I'm separated by a name, you name objects around you. Know, you know, name. language is really a naming system. Uh, what <laughs> is it? It's a long story. Let me tell the story. <laughs> it involves play, now, right? Now, okay, now you have been my storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> so I must tell this okay. story. Let's go back to nine. Oh, the story I'm going to tell is connected with the hat which I'm wearing. You see this one? I started because of this hat which I'm wearing now. Okay. And which I bought in Chile. So how can I? A hat which I bought in Chile last year <laughs> be connected with <laughs> my decision to write in Ikoyo, which I made in 1979. So let me be very quick about the okay. storytelling. Okay. Ninth, you know, this was what I see. I don't think anybody was born. <laughs> then. 1970, so I was born then. Huh? I was born then. Oh, no, no. <laughs> 1966. Oh, no, I wasn't. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to 1966. Okay. I'm a student at the University of Leeds. Okay. I have published We No Child, the river in between. Okay. Then I'm invited mm. to International Pen Conference in New York. Okay. Right? It was a, an, a big conference because for the first time, uh, writers from Eastern Europe or Communist Bloc were allowed into America, into the United States of America. The, Arthur Miller, you heard of Arthur Miller, the American playwright? Yeah, Arthur Miller, yeah. He was then the president of Penn. So he's quite instrumental in getting the State Department to allow you know, uh, writers from the other side of the Cold War to come over. So they arrived from Eastern Europe, you know, uh, you know, and we from Africa, so, uh, and in Latin America. They were there, Carl Fuentes, you know, and others who became part of the Latin American Renaissance, you know, were actually present in a conference, but I did not know all of them at the time, you know. Um, and something else, 
I am invited there as a regional guest of honor from Africa. Mm. Right? And so, and by this time, I'm not quite accepting myself as a writer. So it's a bit like this robe of being called guest of honor from Africa, not just me, guest of honor. <laughs> and there are other regional guests of honor from Latin America and Asia and so on, you know. Um, so I got to New York for the first time. So I'm enjoying this becoming a writer. I don't know how you feel, I'm not quite used to it, but those days how, how does a writer behave? How does he, how does he, how does he write a sit? Yes. <laughs> how do they, uh, do they do their hair like that? Like they lift not? Yeah. <laughs> or do they have a Socratic pose? Like or do they sit like that? <laughs> you know, I've got the image of the writer, because I'm invited to write all these other writers. You know? So I'm not really following very much what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm busy posing, twice a year, nobody cares. So, and then there was, um, I remember this very well, because I came and it was the last panel, which was chaired by Ada Miller, and there were two other people on, on in the panel. One was, uh, Ignatius uh, Sloan, mm -hmm. he's an Italian writer who wrote the novel Bread and Wine. You can Google it if you find Bread and Wine, Sloan or Sloan. And, um, and Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda was there. Yeah, Pablo Neruda there was one of the other panelists. You know. mm -hmm. In fact, the hat I'm wearing right now is a Pablo Neruda. Huh? Is that? Love of Pablo Neruda, oh. which I bought in Chile last year, in remembrance of a uh, uh, meeting, anyway, at that time. So, uh, I'm here, sitting there, and I'm here, I'm so old, you know. Then I hear, I think, I hear his voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hear his voice. Yeah, so I'm still talking. <laughs> uh, so, and he says something like, he's complaining that modern Italian writers were not as, there are not many translations of modern <laughs> Italian writers into English. The next sentence caught my ear. He said, and you know, Italian is not like one of these Bantu languages with one or two words in their vocabulary. Oh my. Gone was the Socratic voice. Huh? <laughs> I remember there was a regional guest of Africa and my continent was now under attack. Huh? So I was the first to shoot up, you know, and I was at Ralph. Forget about all the writers. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and I said, look, African languages have certainly more than two words in their vocabulary. But I was very upset. Another meal I remember, so sort of, it was more diplomatic, because he said, you can praise their own languages, there's nothing wrong with that. We should, not, we should not probably be down huh, playing other people's languages, you know. So, and I, the only thing I remember among the people who lit at the reception, among the people who walked across the whole hall, and he didn't know me, was Pablo Neruda. You know, he came and shook my hand. Uh, I, his Spanish, I, my Spanish was zero. Huh? And his English was Hester, so we didn't really talk very much. Uh, but I, was, I appreciated what I saw as a gesture of solidarity, or what afterwards I thought, a gesture of solidarity. Uh, then, 
Eventually, anyway, I come back to Leeds to resume a novel which I had started writing before I came to America as a guest of honor from Africa, right? The novel which later was called A Grain of Wheat. And I started resuming it. And I said, Ah, in what language am I writing it? Mm. English. But I've just come from New York. Living in Africa is rich in vocabulary or whatever. So I was, by my action, I was actually approving Sloan. You know, I was conceiving the argument mm -hmm. Sloan. Okay, that disturbed me a lot. You know, I even I don't, and I don't know what goes into that, but just, and that's the beginning of what, one of the beginning of my wrestling with the language issue, really. Yeah. Um, so I returned to Kenya um, in 1968. I joined the legislative department. Then one thing or another happened, one thing or another happened, but eventually I started working in the village. Not for, not, not for pay, but working with the community to establish uh, uh, community theater, okay? But now, they we had to use the language that they're using, mm -hmm. not English, you know? So that's when I beginning to encounter my language in a practical way. And these were these were villagers who were not actors at all? They were not actors at all. Yes. They were just regular village workers who go, we about their business, landless, you know, sort of, um, plantation workers, factory workers, you know. That was the whole idea, that you work with the people where they are. That's where a theater is. Yeah? Yeah. Theater is not a building, it's actual people. So, you work with the people. You work with the people, what language are they using? So you, you use the language they are using. So that's a fast, practical confrontation mm. with my language, right? Then a place, a place called Almaro when I want in English translation by Cadet and Nicol. And then a play so successful, performed by peasants and workers, the Kenya government, a post colonial African government, mm. shut the play, burned the play, and midnight 1977, I am arrested and put in a maximum security prison. Mm. Very, very important. So this is really a, <laughs> a long story, but it's important to get the background of how in prison, I start thinking about the language question, yeah, and the role of language in the whole systems of domination, and how central has always been. And it's like a revelation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, the British did it, the French did it, the Spanish did it, kind of, you know, I mean, it's like a revelation. <laughs> so, thereafter, so because I was thinking, why should an African government put me in prison for writing in an African language, you know, although I had said similar things in English, and nothing had happened to me, mm. right? So I want to start thinking about this, right? Yeah. And it was in prison that I made the decision to write in the core of my mother tongue. Mm. So my first work of fiction in the core, I wrote in prison on toilet paper. On toilet paper? Yes, in prison. It was an act. I had to do it. Then, there, okay, and I've not looked back. Expert, you know, I read the English of times when I want to argue <laughs> with people, <laughs> when I'm in my conferences, you know, yeah. or occasionally in my memoirs. I love my fiction, poetry, and so on. Uh, I write in uh, looking for a Oh, yeah. My point.
poetry. I'll be reading. Is it? Yeah. I shall be reading. That's the one. The Italian book? Yeah, I shall be. We are reading now. We are what? I think we are reading some of my poetry tonight. Tonight, yes. Yes. Julian, yes. So yeah. You are all welcome. <laughs> anyway, sorry for the long oh, answer, that's but okay. I'm for the food in the background. Because not just some which happened just like that. Yes. There's a history. And the reason I say there's a connection between names. See, we start with names. Yeah. Because in the same way that African people built a continent, lost their names, you are given the name of the plantation owner who now says, Oh, I own you. And it's like only you, is that you carry my name. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the same way, African languages were banned in the plantation. Mm -hmm. Right? And some people were actually harmed or caught speaking. Their own they, languages. Yeah, their own languages. Whereas the English planter, the Dutch planter, the Spanish planter never lost their linguistic connection to Europe. Mm -hmm. But Africans were made to lose their linguistic, even that element, you know, their linguistic connections to, uh, to Africa, right? Now, so then, of course, many years later, I keep seeing, all, oh my God, it's not just Africa, huh? uh, Native, Native Americans, they were exactly the same thing. Lose me to their names, their languages, so on, in what they call, uh, I don't, I hear in Canada they call them residential schools. Residential schools, yeah. Yeah, I, know, I think America they call it, in, a, in USA they call it something, but probably any it's the same idea of residential schools. Mm -hmm. okay? And I'm telling you, it was the same process. Yeah? Children brought forth from the West to the East, in the residential schools cut off their parents and so on, and then they are given English names. So the first day of arrival, they become English names, okay? Then of course their language are humiliated and so on, terrible things. So, it's Maori people, mm -hmm. the same thing in New Zealand, Australia, the same thing, right? Uh, Japan, when they colonized Korea, I think it was in 1945, they banned Korean language and they imposed. Huh? Uh, well, this connects, this connects to another idea of yours um, related to your book, Something Torn in You. You've talked about that book and said it's about the politics of memory. Yeah. And yeah. can you tell us a bit more about that idea? How does memory become political? It's connected with naming again. See, names carry memory, <laughs> right? You know, meaning uh, when I say, um, like uh, you asked me my name, I said, Bobby, what's your know? It's all talks about the relationship. Bobby is son of Yomo, okay? Uh, the other communities where the names do really their sentences, which tell our history in, and so on. You know? So names uh, uh, it's like name is carrying a memory. Okay. Say the name of a place. Say when America when uh, the English came to America, the oh no, New York is a good example. Let me use yeah. the example of New York. Because when the Dutch were well, first to, to occupy um, New York, they call it New Amsterdam, mm. right? So now, according New Amsterdam, is is now planting a new memory, okay? And that new memory buries the older memory signified by the names which people were then. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know. So, um, you know, and when the English came, if you the Dutch, they didn't stick to New Amsterdam, they said called New York, right? 
he left New York, New York, New England, New Britain, and so on, you know. But all those names vary the memory targeted by the older naming system. So the new naming becomes the starting point of new memory, which then projected as the real identity mm -hmm. of, that, of that place, you know. So it, all these are connected, you know, the naming, the language, and so on. And that's why my book, two of my books actually I talk about this. One of them is the colonizing in the mind. Where I talk about the language issue. Which as I said, when I go to a place when I go to New Zealand or India or many other places, people relate to the colonizing in the mind. Because yeah. I realize that the language in question has been part of the colonial system in their own uh, countries and so on. Here I've been, you know, uh, uh, Aurma here has been telling me about the um, indigenous people here and so on. And the parallels are, see, well, <laughs> she could be talking about Kenya, <laughs> my own experience yes. and so on, you know, yeah. So in those two books I talk about it, the um, correct mind, and the other one is something torn and new, yeah. which I did talk about really the quality of memory. Very, very important, you know, um, politics of memory and name and you know, as part of that politics of memory. So what advice do you have, and I'm thinking of, um, we have students all over the world who um, are writing in English in our program, but for them, English is maybe a second or third or fourth language in their life. What do you have, what advice do you have for students who maybe feel the pressure to write in English? That's okay. You, you, a story comes to you, just do it. What I'm asking you, I'm asking you to think about that relationship, yeah. okay, between their language which they have in English, or French, or Spanish, and so on. Um, uh, what do I mean by this? Um, the, there's nothing wrong with the English language. There's nothing wrong with French. French, they have beautiful languages. Mm -hmm. But so also is Yoruba, so also is Japanese, so also is Russian, so also is Zulu, so also is Koyo. In other words, every language has unique musicality, okay? And no language is more of a language than any other language. And no musicality is more of a musicality than any other musicality. You bring to that that is possible. A good example is, I'm sure most of you probably play the piano, you play different instruments, I know for instance, uh, for example, you have a Michael, play the guitar, for instance, many other, uh, oil. Uh, there is. Oh, <laughs> what, what, what is it your name is? <laughs> Japan, Japan and then. Yes. <laughs> His name is Japan and then, but if we just also, yeah, Japan means what in your other language? Gambo? Gambo. Gambo, yeah, Gambo means Japan, you know, hero, okay? Yeah, so uh, he plays the guitar, he plays the piano, he plays, I don't know how many, he sings, he composes, he writes books. You know, and he studied. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, a piano is not more of a musical instrument than, say, the violin mm -hmm. or the guitar. They are equally musical instruments. Okay? So you cannot say, let us stop, let's advance. All play the piano. It's all music we play the piano and not the guitar, no, which is the same, exactly the same thing of conditioning we have been put under to think that the real writability 
is in English or French or Portuguese or whatever, right? And it's nonsense. You know? They are beautiful languages, but they are no more of language than any other language because each language has its unique musicality. And language can relate, you know, in other ways. Like for instance, translation. Mm -hmm. You know, you can write in Russian. I know Russian literature, but well, I don't know it very well, but I've read Tolstoy, Tolstoy, and others. But the other is translation. Yeah. Okay. So that can be done. Okay. Yeah. So the key thing is, uh, if you feel, I mean. Like some of many of the people are talking about, we are probably English is probably now their first language. Yeah. You know, just do it. But I presume that if you've got another language, it's your mother tongue, please don't give up your mother tongue for another language, whatever it is, because your mother tongue has its unique musicality. And that musicality is not any one less than musicality in any other language. Okay? And you can't replicate. Like the musicality of the guitar, you cannot replicate it in a piano. You can play the same melody, right? <laughs> but not quite the same texture yes. of sound, you know, right? Yeah. So let me ask you about that, because when you write in Kikuyu, you also translate yourself from Kikuyu to English. Yes. What, do, you, do you think that you discover things through that translation? Is it very di it's different for you to write in Kikuyu and translate to English than it would be for you to write in English in the first place? Translating is another activity altogether, really, quite frankly, and I really and I have to by the way, to really appreciate translators, actually, <laughs> really. Translators are actually writers themselves. Yes. Because when, when someone translates, it's a different, a not different in other content, but really, it's like they've written a whole book. Yeah. Only instead of thinking about the material. I mean, so they're translating, yes, but they have to think about the words, the imagery, I mean, you have to think about all sorts of things. At the same time, the extra challenge of being as faithful as they can to the original text. In that sense, the writer may be, in fact, writing directly may be easier because at least you play around with the material. <laughs> but he, the trans she, he or she, the translator, has, is bound <laughs> <laughs> by the book they have. Or do you ever struggle to translate your own work? Yes, you do. I mean, it's the same process because you're trying to say the same thing. I mean, it's what is written in Gikoyo in uh, English. And then, again, it's to do the musicality of the two languages. Mm. You know, it's very difficult to replicate the musicality of one language in terms of another. But you try the best you can to render the spirit of that musicality in another. It's like, again, you have the piano, you can play the same melody with the piano, but the texture is very different, you know, yeah, or with the guitar, and so on. Yeah, and this becomes a challenge, yeah, for me as a, but you learn, also learn a lot yes. from that process of translation. You learn something more about the two languages and how, in what ways they are different and in what ways they are similar, yeah. I'd like to open it up for questions from students. Yes. Wait, tell us your name and tell us what program. Yes, you. I'm Tyson. I'm in well, like political science, but creative writing as well. Um, I was actually going to ask about the translating as well, because I thought that was really interesting. I saw um, that you worked with another translator as well, aside from with yourself. Um, how was it finding someone else translating your work instead of you? Did you find that um, they kind of, like, how did you feel they did with it? So well, you, when you work with another, I'm just going to repeat the, I'm just going to repeat uh, okay, the question. Yeah, yeah. um, so when you were working with another translator, how did you find that experience? Um, yeah, actually, that's a good question. Because a 
all my, I've done my own translation sometimes, but three or four of my books have also been translated by another translator, not me. I don't have to work with them, they just tra do the translation. And it's very good translation. The novel called Matigari, mm -hmm. Koyo, was translated by one Moiwagoro into English. And that is very good. You know, you know, probably better than I would have been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the novel that was arrested. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, let me see. Let me tell you a story. Then. I feel there's a story coming. You're triggered. <laughs> She's triggering so many stories. You know? yeah. um, yes, my first novel in my mother tongue, the Koyo, is called Devil on the Cross. Mm -hmm. This is the one I wrote in Kamete, Maximum Secure Prison, uh, on Thai paper, uh, in 19, between December 1977 to December 1978. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for those who may want to follow this, uh, I've issued my memoir of prison under the the title, Wrestling with the Devil, you know, meaning wrestling with the devil or the devil on the cross. Mm -hmm. means wrestling with the whole idea of writing a, writing a novel in the prison conditions in the new language and toilet paper and so on. It's like wrestling with the devil. Mm. But the devil has other connotations as well. You know, so what story was that telling you my story? About your book that got arrested. Oh yes. So Devil on the Cross was my first novel, which I was going to tell you the in prison. Uh, it went through so many adventures. So because when I came out of prison in nineteen seventy eight, quite frankly, the result of the death of the previous president mm -hmm. and Kite Power a new one was even more hostile to, any, uh, to me than even to the previous one. And the international pressure for my release. You know, uh, I had difficulties. My publisher was for East African Edifice Publishers. Mm -hmm. And he got threats you know, on telephone for publishing for when it was, became known that it was going to publish the novel that I had written in prison, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in Koyo, okay? Shaitan Mugarapai again, or the one the cross. Now, they threatened him, telephone, anonymous calls. But he was, at that time, his African Review Publishers was a branch of London Heinemann. So even London and Quota was telling it's not worth publishing it. Mm. Yeah, you don't know if you are like or whatever it is, you know. And, but he, he felt strongly about it. He, he just went ahead. But a week or so before he was due to release the novel, armed people came to his house. They were in a car. His name is Henry Jacobo, by the way. He was abducted. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, to put him in the boot of their car. You know, by that time, another car happened to come towards them. So they got their machetes and they tried to cut him off. As he defended, tried to put sand there, they actually managed to cut off his finger, so it was to be reattached, you know. Uh, and even now, Henry Chakawa has this meeting, he has this finger, he keeps on doing it, it's never quite mm. he came back to, you know. So there you go. Now, the key thing, the thing is, anyway, he went ahead and published the novel, despite that. Yeah. OK? 
in Ovidia of Italia in great form. Now, later, I won't go to the whole story, but later, I end up myself in exile because the new press becomes even more repressive than the previous one. Yeah. So I'm forced into exile in London. And in London, I go to London to help uh, publish uh, the English translation of my prison memoir and also the novel I wrote in prison. Okay. But in London, I knew, I got in information that what they call a red carpet awaited for me if I returned to Kenya. Mm. Yeah, at the airport. So I just continued. I felt shipwrecked in England. Mm. So here I am, in England, in London, at my publisher's apartment, and I, I cannot return. And I've committed myself to writing in Koyo. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm here in an English environment, you know, totally. So the challenge for me, how do I keep faith? Yes. Okay, do I have the, even the courage to keep faith in writing, you know? So I wrote a new novel. Yes. In Nigikoyo, in London, in an English speak. It's like, like, I don't know, I felt. Now, let me test my will. <laughs> I'm in an English speaking environment, so I wrote another novel, Matigari. Yes. Matigari came out in Kenya, I think it was 1976, I believe. And the main character, you know, is a person, it's a fictional character. But he goes around the country asking where can I find truth mm. in this country. He goes, when he meets children, he has them, teachers, he has them, you know. So rumors started that there's a person going around the country asking awkward questions or whatever, mm. right? You know. uh, in those days, I was like, law or something in Kenya that you cannot have rumors. Rumor mongering, as they call it, was actually banned. Huh? Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Amoy, the president then, sent for the arrest of this man called Matigari. Okay. <laughs> That's fictional man. Yeah, but he did not know his Because when people talk about people, that was a real living person called Matigari, <coughs> who is defined. You know, anyway, if they go to arrest this man and they find he's only a character in the fiction mm. called Matigari. In it, oh, Matigari, mind you, oh, Matigari. So instead, when they burn the book, not even, no, first of all, they arrest the book in this way. The police would go, there was a squad, which would go to, into all the bookshops. Pretend that they were booksellers from another one. They said, Oh, this book is very popular. We have just uh, finished my orders. I would like to, <laughs> to buy whatever here. Of course, they go and bring out what they have. Then they take their badges. Oh, confiscate. Yeah, all the books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even the ones which were in the publishers, warehouse, arrested the novel. So for many years, the novel was not available in Kenya, in Koyo. Mm. And the irony was this, you know, uh, later I had it translated by Wagul huh? and it came out. <laughs> it was free in London, in English. <laughs> <laughs> it was not free in Koyo, in Kenya. Right? Yeah. What do you think was so threatening about about that novel, Inga Koyu, about your play 
with the with the villagers in their own language. What do you think in particular? Because you have written books that, that it, in English, and you said you covered the same yeah, sort of topics. Yeah, that's So um, what do you think was so threatening to the government? I think it just come back to the language issue. I think the, for the conditioning about the English language and so on, but also the problem, I can only summarize, you know, the fact that in my life in Ikoyo, mm. even though not all Kenyans can read at the same time, because we have both many mother tongues in Kenya, mm. but at least in terms of, of the class of ordinary people, some of them are able to read it in Ikoyo, mm. in a Right. So is that is what is written in English is like a little bit of a linguistic prison or linguistic uh, not prison but call it anything you like but, but divorce from the people mm. because only about ten percent of Kenyans speak English and can read English. Mm. So when you get intellectual production of any kind, and you put it in English, it is confined to about 10% of the population. Class-wise, it means confined to the elite mm -hmm. only. It is an advantage that they can reach the elite of all the different linguistic communities but they eat anyway. In Iko, at the very least, is able <laughs> to meet a section of the ordinary man and the woman. Mm. That is who can read. Really, yeah. And that's dangerous. Well, for me, it has, it empowers the people. Mm. It enriches their imagination. Mm. Does it, but for the government, an impressive, impressive states, they might have ideas. Mm -hmm. And Kenya, under the dictatorship, is no longer, today we don't have a dictatorship. I would make that very clear. Today, we don't have a dictatorship. You know, the repressive condition, you know, under the Moi regime in Kenya was extensive or pervasive and so on. But in general, uh, and you can go about this a little bit, uh, repressive regimes fear the word which has become flesh. Mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson. Right? With Emily Dickinson, the point, you know, she talked about it, the word which has become flesh, or the power of the world, which has become flesh. You know? Many represent regimes fear the world, which breathes life. Yeah. More questions from students? Yes. Can um, you tell us your name and where you're from? Um, I'm from Kenya. My name is Wanjiro, um, and I'm in my second year, so I'm Great. So my question is, I think of language a lot as well. So how I've grown up is the language of instruction is English. Um, our parents would talk to us in Ikoyo, and then we would respond in mm. So um, I guess what happens is you end up not being a master at any of the languages. And then it's also interesting because you experience, you'd experience one word in English, and then you'd experience another word in and I think much more for people um, this uh, recent generation. And so my question is, coming now here to Canada and then trying to get into a creative writing program, and then you just can't help but feel like a contradiction. So you're trying to um, tell the story. It's very interesting normal activities in normal creative writing activities. So you're trying to do the stories in English, but you experience them in Swahili mm -hmm. or in Kenyan English. 
but you're trying to give them in the English that people are speaking here. So um, what's your advice? Actually, I have two questions. So that's my first question. So okay. what's your advice to someone, to African writers, um, who are trying to navigate writing, but are not being seen? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, first of all, first of all, she really, Wanjiro has, uh, by the way, Wanjiro is a very beautiful name. And uh, I don't want to digress a little bit, but I won't tell you about my new work. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't bring a copy of the book. I would have read uh, in Prince of Wanjiro, you know, uh, a section of Prince of Wanjiro. It's called Kaidamo Yuru. It means there are the nine. They are the nine or ten daughters of Ikoyo and Mombe, who are supposed to be, to be the father and mother of the Ikoyo community, mm -hmm. of the Ikoyo people where I come from. You know. And they have those names, those women had nine had names. Among the names, Wajiro. Wajiro is the old test of the, uh, the other nine daughters, mm -hmm. which is very important. <laughs> culture and history and so on. You know, uh, like, yeah. um, so I will tell you about Wajiro. When you get the book, Head on with you, you can read about yourself there and your exploits. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, what she has said exemplifies the problem that I'll be talking about. Where the Kenyan and African youth generally have been socialized into assuming that we are giving our children an advantage by making them not know uh, their mother tongue. Mm. Meaning, I don't know about your family, but generally I know it's a family in Kenya. Uh, Father and mother will speak perfectly good, but when it comes to their children, in English. Mm -hmm. Right? And they are very proud that the fact that their children don't know their, the language which they two are speaking. Mm -hmm. They are even more proud <laughs> when they speak it in, in a broken way, so when they are not, I mean, oh, I, in, a, in a matter quite clearly show that they can't speak the language, mm -hmm. right? When there's trauma, then they can laugh and say, oh, our children, this children, our children, they, they don't know our language. But, you know, but they do it in good faith, remember? It's not that they are saying we are going to advantage our children. They are doing it because they are under the belief that they are giving their children Mm. Okay. The head starts, so speak. You know. And in a sense, they are right. Because in most African countries, English is the language of power. Right? Meaning, the language of administration, the language of education, the language of advancement, and so on. Okay? So, it is a reality in our lives no matter what, you know, okay? And so parents are not necessarily doing a negative thing in pushing their children. By so doing, they are also alienating them from the language of the community, mm -hmm. you know? So that, as she says quite uh, well, very well, such a child, uh, now, even to their grandmother, they have to speak in Kiswahili. And the grandmother does not understand maybe Kiswahili. Them. Yes, it's a free communication with the community, the immediate community, which is often very formative in the intellectual image of growth of any child, you know. They are disconnected, <laughs> you know, in a, from that linguistic environment that impacts their growth and so on, in terms of, you know, in terms of their growth, that their connection with that community, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a tragedy really for Africa, you know, um, 
because of it is disconnect. Okay? And it comes from the mistaken notion that to in order to be a master of English, you must be ignorant when it comes to your own language. They quit knowledge of English with ignorance of your own language, <laughs> right? Yeah. To know this, you must not know this, right? You know, your, your mother tongue must die in relation to you. You have to become alive in English, okay? Very false situation. In the sense, you know, most of you are here, you come to, let's say, University of California, our uh, University of um, uh, British Columbia. <laughs> I'm glad to say British Columbia. Interchangeable with California. Well, you know, you know this name had a memory of place by then. You know, mm -hmm. people who lived here, you know, for they had names of this place. Mm -hmm. Then others come and call it British Columbia, mm -hmm. which reminds of Columbus and the British, <laughs> right? Another memory, but that's another story, you know. Um, what else is saying? So how should she tell her story then? That, uh, I mean, how can what was I say? The advice of how to be in different languages now. You will come mm. to the advice. Yeah, I'll come <laughs> to the advice, hopefully. No, or okay, right, anyway, what I'm saying, you come here to study. You can come here, study French. But the University of California of Canada will not tell you mm. of you, can yes. tell us in you must first of all give up. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Say English. If they come and speak in English, you don't tell them you must be I never I must never hear you speaking your English and I should punish you to speak in English. If you come in Spanish, I'll punish you in mm -hmm. order enough for you to master mm -hmm. uh, whatever they are doing here, French, mm -hmm. they must give up. There, at the normal circumstances, there's no equation mm -hmm. of being being ignorant of one language does not make, make you necessarily better in another language. Yes. You know, in fact, it's known that if you are master of one language, say your mother tongue, you are in a better position eh, to actually master many other languages. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's what I just wanted to hear. You know, uh, now, having said that, we can't do anything. If I still come to you in, the, in English, Please don't delay it and still master it for you. Just write it in English, because you never know. Maybe one day you might translate it for you, or get someone to translate it for you, or Kiswahili, and so on. You got to use the Kiswahili in your life, Kiswahili. Maybe one day you have to translate it to English or into for um, you. But for you, you are very lucky. You are still very young. To add a coil with your English and Kiswahili without losing mm -hmm. the advantages you have in knowing. Uh, it's not an evil thing to know English, it's a beautiful language, right? So, right. But the most important thing is a language, especially as a writer, that enables you to connect, especially if you are returning to Kenya, for instance, a language which allows you to connect with the people in a, because from the people that you get the images, the insights of the sounds, the things that also trigger your imagination. Okay. So when you are young enough, just add it for you. But don't lose your English. You know that okay, either don't do the other mistake or you know must lay up on you. No, it's you add power to yourself by connecting with your mother tongue, right? Yeah. Then the three languages enrich each other, and you become the most powerful writer in the world. Hopefully, right? What was your second question? Um, my second question was, um, I don't know what to do this question. Um, so. Huh? My second question is, um, I think some say 
and especially as a young person, and I, 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 when you can't even label yourself as a writer, but you're interested in writing. Mm -hmm. So I think as I am personally I'm very interested in like, um, history and political history in Kenya in that time. So there's one, the issue of you don't feel like you have the authority to write on that because mm -hmm. you didn't experience it. And then two, because I think most of that history was stored through oral transmission. It's also difficult to get that history. And if you do get it, you don't get it from um, African voices. You get it more through the, um, I, I think, British, scholar, British scholarship. So um, just, I don't, I'm not sure what the question is, yeah. but like, just yeah. the entire um, idea of that. Just feeling like you don't have the yeah, you guys have, I just, I'm glad you asked that question because the greatest equalizer, of course, we are scholars and we do research and all that kind of thing, but it does the kind of writing of fiction, poetry, and so on. The greatest imagination is the greatest democratic equalizer. Okay, you cannot say I'm eight to one. Oh, I'm eight to one. Although, but you can write it the item you want. Huh? You can start with one and then eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not quite. So it's so obviously, but only eight one. You know. But you can say you're eight, and therefore your imagination is oh more years, therefore more imagination. Child and them, if you can tell a story fictionalized, we can grip you, right? Or draw something, right? That can grip you, you know. So imagination knows really no age, no gender. Right? You know? And I don't like this business of I've already defied I mean, that this way. I've already defied this business. I'm a student, therefore I cannot do this, you know. And what is it? I was born in Japan, and yeah. Is Japan here? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, he left. No, he's still here. He's still here? Yeah. Yeah. Japan, <laughs> can you stand for a minute? Can you please stand up? I want to see you, because they, they might think I'm talking about an eight or one year old. I think it's 20 years. <laughs> but he has already published a book, you know. Right, I saw it, I bought, I bought a copy. All right, you give me a copy. Can take it okay. What's the title of your book? It's called The Refuge in the Dynamite Desire. It's a memoir. A memoir. A memoir. In fact, I told you, you have my memoir. I said, What? <laughs> <laughs> You're writing a memoir? How old are you? <laughs> you me 20. Oh my God, I said, Yeah, I'm writing a memoir. Yes. It is because he's writing about his experiences and the basis of that memoir, okay? And his experiences are no less valid than my experiences. In the same way, the experiences up to the age you are is no less valid than any other person's experiences. And you draw from your own experiences and then you have the imagination. And the imagination said there's not enough age or whatever. Always there, please. Okay? Don't say I'm a student now and I cannot do it, but when I graduate and I get a PhD, I'll do it. No, no, just do it. Of course, there's some other things you need to research and so on that's slightly different, you know, right? Uh, but even research, why not? So if you feel like writing, just do it, okay? Just do it and see what happens, okay? Yeah. Yes. Tell us your name, first. I'm Floyd. And what year are you employed? Uh, fourth year. Fourth year, great. Um, so we've talked about individual or singing languages. We've talked about English or all the other languages. But it's a um, I wanted to know what you thought about. Of languages. I mean, 
living in the future. In that some of the new generation now write Chinese or Hindi within English, with Wolof within French, whether it be in dialogue or within the core of the text. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you Oh, that's not the wrong. I mean, so you know, me, me, the more languages, <laughs> Mary, another, you can you have got another language, other young people have got another language. It's called Sheng. Yeah, Sheng. Where they, I don't know, I can't speak the language, but, you know, and people are changing all the time, you know. Uh, a scholar in London and they've written a book on Sheng. Yeah, you, you know, which is, but, the book is one of his conference professor of African studies in that school, I mean, of African or unrelated languages in Universal London, Shaggy Yeah. Um, the shame, and there have been languages. Languages are always, the tendency for languages is to become multilingual. Monolingualism, quite frankly, is the... Uh, do you know carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Monolingualism is the carbon monoxide of culture. Multilingualism is the oxygen mm. of culture. Proof. Even one language is always trying to split into many. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mean in English, right here, you know, English is. Yes. Huh? Because the many is trying to break out of the construction of the one, you know, like, ah, you know, because one express self of this way and that way, you know. Uh, now, when as I said earlier, when Af and still Africans were brought onto the plantation, sugar plantations, and their languages were banned, right? In other words, their linguistic connection to Africa was cut off. Where that of the plant that was not linguistically cut off from, say France, Spain, and so on. What did they do? They were not even taking schools, but they could hear the sounds of English as a master and so on. The language is fine. What they do in their heads as to those rhythms of African speech might be there because you can't approve <laughs> that one. It's very difficult. You know? They hear the sounds. So what you get in the Caribbean and Afro American is new linguistic systems. Okay? Uh, so they call it Creole or whatever, I know. Ebonics in America, they call it. Okay? Some people say it's broken English, and I say nonsense. It's, an, it's a, a different signified system that it develops. Okay? Yeah. And this signified system that develops in a plantation and slave produce the most incredible works like the spirituals. Right? You know the spirituals? Uh, you know the spirituals, what well, is in the, you know the American spirituals where they're like uh can I say oh, oh freedom so strong that they are very much alive today, okay? The same linguistic system deals with groups, okay? Right? Okay. And prepositions in the linguistic system. The same linguistic system deals with jazz, right? 
again impacted the world over South Africa, Russia, Japan, and hip hop. <laughs> now all over Ireland, even, I don't know about Canada, but... Oh uh, yes, all over Canada, Canada too. You know? Hip hop, yes. Yeah, in Canada, where all over the world comes from the same linguistic system. Okay? So, new languages are not necessarily negative things. The negativity comes when we think that one, in order for one language to be, others must die. Mm. That's what's wrong. It's not the meanness of languages, right? It's the notion that in order, say, for ink to be, other languages must cease to be, right? Okay. Or, put another way, and as a colonial system, English, Spanish, and French were planted on the graveyard of other languages, yeah. or on the tombs of other languages. And so, no, actually, languages can relate to each other, they can treat the other, they can give oxygen. For one language to be, it's not necessary that another one must die. Okay. So in the same way, new languages as fine, you know, uh, as long as they are not necessarily replacing any other language, as well by force, okay? But they can feed each other. And all. Yeah, they can give something to each other. Other questions? Yes, hand in the back there. Tell us your name and, and what faculty you're in. Oh, we're having trouble hearing you. Okay, hi. Sure. So, so, the, so the question is for you, what makes a story good? Mm -hmm. That which makes a person stop and read it. <laughs> yeah. That, what I want to say is that, um, you remember when, I don't know about your mom or, or my, let's say my mother, never, for some reason she didn't like physical punishment at all. Huh? I'm very grateful to her for that. But sometimes I wished she had beaten me as well. <laughs> because the way she would look at me in silence sometimes when I do something not in its approval was more piercing <laughs> than any amount of beating she might have given me. Okay? In other words, that look, whatever it was, without even though it's wordless has power. So in the same way, words or a story you put, the way you put together, you know, the power, it, there's no magic formula about it, except that you know it when you do it and you see its effect on another person. Yeah. You may think, and by the way, ironically, the more, and I'm talking about the works of imagination, like fiction and so on, the more personal it seems to me, the more you think you are wrestling with only things. Sometimes if I say, ah, if I say this, oh my God, people will know it's about me or something. Huh? But then you write it, and somebody comes and tells you, how did you know this is about me? <laughs> I think most writers experience that way. When someone comes and says, but you're talking about me, eh? right? <laughs> yeah. Because when you wrestle with things which are within you, and what we, you know, 
that's when you are able to speak to more people, right? So, uh, try, I would try to see what is that which is tra not troubling, but which is agitating me, that makes me that I must write this, you know, whatever. That's, to me, that is very, that feeling is what I call the soul, <laughs> you know. Uh, even you come to that soul which is within you, that's when you are actually able to speak to me. That will make the story good. And it's good because it affects more people. More people will say, ah, this one is speaking to me. How does she know about me? Huh? Right? Or just, how do you know about my mother? This is what exactly what my mother, <laughs> <laughs> you know, tells us or something like that. You know, then you know you've got a good thing. But sometimes, you write something and you really are intending that everybody should laugh and they start crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, then you have to go back and see what it is that you did. Maybe it's so good that it produces crying, but you know, but you just keep on learning from people's reactions and so on. But in the end, you keep on drawing from yourself and your imagination. And I would say, in the end, I would say, trust your imagination more than anything else. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, So I'll just repeat the question in case we can hear it for the video. So the question was, you mentioned earlier that monolinguism is like carbon monoxide. So for people who are monolinguistic, how can we stretch ourselves? And, and no, you... if I can explain that, I don't mean that if you, if you are monolingual, meaning that's the only language you know, huh? that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't apologize <laughs> also for it, please, you know. I meant when a monolingualism is forced on a community, right? We all must speak English. That monolingualism of the community is actually for the carbon monoxide of cultures, okay? Right? Uh, what I want to linger when all of us are, can both speak English, I suppose, and also other languages and so on, you know, that is. The, where the oxygen comes from. And I give the example where even within one language, say Japanese or, or Kiswahili, the tendency for a new language to emerge from it is there's always tension between conserving a language and a grammar and so on, how it's said, and the refusal of the language to be so contained, you know, so you get new expressions and so on. And by the languages, including in changes at the level of the ordinary, when it's not that, not, language not, that's not just in grammar books, it's just in the streets, that's spoken new expressions, you know, and then we try to conserve it, come on, bring it back to the, uh, to, to the standard English and so on, but always of itching to break, you know, so the house of Babel, you know, the same thing. You know, where trying to have one language, they find that they are speaking different languages. You know, but if you are monolingual, that's all right. My only advice is that actually, if you are able to know another language, you find it fascinating. Indeed, I might be able to draw from that other language. The real point I was trying to make at an individual level is a question of having to give up your mother tongue or the language of community come from, or you live in, in order to become monolingual, mm -hmm. say in English or French, okay, or monolingual in any other language, as against uh, your relationship to the language of your community.
you but if we are the only la the language you have, and, and please, people, uh, when I talk about it, please don't apologize. For, <laughs> for if you feel like you can write in English, just go ahead. If you're monolingual, there's nothing wrong with that. By monolingual, you know. But I'm talking about the monolingualism of like a communities like here. Mm -hmm. We say only English, okay, right? Uh, and when you tell people you cannot, you're not educated or you, or you cannot learn unless you do English and so on, yeah. But if you're monolingual, what do you think about it? But my own advice, my own thing is language is so beautiful. It's like if you know a piano, yeah, you may want, want to add another instrument, isn't it? Do you play music? Yeah. Well, or you don't play music, you may actually want to start. I started playing the piano at the age of uh, seven, so five. Really? Yeah, that's when I started learning piano. I've got a piano teacher today, she comes every week. And, and she, I'm eight or one, she's seven or nine. <laughs> or seven, and she tells me, oh, music is very good for old people. <laughs> <laughs> music is very good for, <laughs> music is very good for old people. Like, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's a danger of the creative writing workshop or academia imposing monolingualism, though, especially when students from around the world are pressured to come to North America to go to university? You know, I like to see, part of this, I don't know how they be done in practical terms, but really, when it comes to creative writing, mm -hmm. I think people be encouraged to write in whatever language they can. I know it's a challenge and so on. Mm -hmm. But there can be many ways of meeting that challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, can say write in whatever language, you know, you if, if you're free. As long as you're also willing to give us a translation. Mm -hmm. So because I'm not even the only because if you write in Swahili and I'm an English speaker and I'm not a teacher, I can't read it in Swahili. Huh? And there may be no resources to get a Kiswahili. Uh, but if you translate the story to me, that's fine. But I also acknowledge that you have written the original Kiswahili. Yeah. So I think I think we could experiment with these things in the creative writing. So, you know, uh, and I'll tell you why I feel strongly about this. You know. Uh, uh, in Nairobi University, where I was teaching at the time, and we had a change of the, of the English department, when you call it the literature department. Uh, there's a whole history to it, I'm going to it right now. Uh, we call it the literature department, the University of Nairobi. There used to be about 10 papers or 9 papers and so on. And one paper is what we call independent paper. And we had allowed that in an independent paper, you could write a creative piece. Okay? Now, this was after I had left. One student wrote his creative piece in Igekoyo. He wrote a novel, I think, or something wrong story in Igekoyo. Mm -hmm. huh? And it sent it every said you cannot submit it. Okay, so I said it's a creative piece, you know. If it's a creative piece you're asking for, why can't he or she present it in Korea? You can demand a translation if you want to, right? That would be fair enough if you are English teachers and so on, you know. But why condition? person, any person, that creativity is only possible in English. To me it seems to be 
terrible thing we as Christian teachers will be doing, or will be doing a disservice to imagination, to literature. If we do in any way either encourage or give the impression that creativity is only possible uh, in English. It's an experiment, you know. Okay. You want to write a short story? Write it in if you want to. Some come and say, I refuse to write in Swahili. Yeah, go ahead. Or in a you know in a first nation language. Yeah. I think I'll try to say, yeah, go ahead. But I'll demand one thing, I'm sorry. Yeah? Unless I can get a translation, then I'll say, you know, but I also need <laughs> a translation. It's never work for yeah. the person. And I know how because I do it myself. But that was a fair game. But I think conditioning people that they can only be creative only in English is actually anti-creativity. I'm sorry to put that to you. It's really totally anti. Uh, because imagination has not worked, I think. Yeah. And you can tell a good story in any language and do all over the world in history have always told very good stories, even orally in their different languages, even in Sheng. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Julia. Can I ask you to talk about your short story which is available in languages? Huh? Oh, and she's called a woman now. <laughs> a woman. A woman. Yes. She has little beautiful names. Yes. How are many, but Aruba in the middle one? Otonia. Otonia. Aruba, Otonia. Very beautiful name of Otonia. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I have to digress. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us this about uh, your short story that has appeared in many languages to illustrate a good story? Oh, uh, yes. Do you have Jabanene? Uh, yeah. Any projects? To, <laughs> are you able to project the story here? Please, you see, <laughs> Andrew might be able to help you. Oh. He's, he's, oh. He wants to project to the. He's so he's, he's yeah. Please, yeah. Thank you very much for that. It's a gorgeous thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, while he's projecting in this story, um, yeah. Thank you very much. I completely. <laughs> How many languages does it appear in? Do you know? I know. Up now is now in eight, eight languages in the world. But to me, the genesis, you know, she's going to show us. So we are, I'd like to, to know the link. Some, the year 2000, 2015, a group of young people who call themselves Pan African Collective wrote me through my son, Mukoma Wagogi. Mukoma is also a writer and a professor of English at Prince, ah, not Princeton, but Cornell University. <laughs> uh, he uh, asked me whether I could give them a short story in Nikoyo because they were, had a new journal called Jalada, J L A D A, and they wanted to start a translation issue. It was coming in English, but they wanted to try a translation issue where they would get African to African translation, meaning a story originally written in an African language being available in the other African languages. Okay? Right? Uh, now, unfortunately, I didn't really, I couldn't write a story on demand, I'm very poor. <laughs> but I remember I had a story which I had written for my daughter, uh, Mombi, uh, uh, for Christmas gift or something. And as I had to give it to her, it was there in a shell. You know, uh, the story is called It We Can A Real. Muru 
gutuika ria muru garu kana kira kitu maga ado madie maru gi Some of the visual interpretation draw on their own cultural histories, mm -hmm. like the Maya civilization. Okay, some of the images, some of the sculptures, you know. Uh. Oh, surrender. surrender. I think what I will do, I will just send them the links. They yes, please, yeah, do that. Thank yeah, you. okay. Yes. Any? Yeah. Huh? All right, over there. Uh. <laughs> 
Yeah, please. And you look at it and pass on the message to anybody else, you know. But it's also just, they're so just seeing the whole, oh, language is more in the same page. It's for me very, um, and you that by the group of African young people based in Arabi. And they one of the leaders of that group, of the transition project is called Moses Kiloro. Yeah. And you find, when you go to the link and you find uh, a language which you know mm. and into which it has not been translated mm. and will become part of that global phenomenon. Write to Moses Kilolo, I think he's given his contact there and he'll tell you whether that language is being translated by someone else to give it go ahead. Yeah. That's amazing. I think that's a great, a, a great place for us to finish it. We now all have a task to go to the website to have a look at all 88 translations in the yeah. various linguistic forms yeah. and non-linguistic forms, but to also look to see if we have a language that it has not been translated into yet, and yeah. to contact, uh, contact the creator of the website. Yes, yeah, that would be great. You know, he's a world, you know, well, tell him, you just check in case he's already assigned to somebody else. Yes. When it's free, he says, go ahead. Yeah. Wonderful. And he acknowledges the translator and their biographies, and so they are part of the conversation. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, so I want to take this uh, moment to thank our guest, Goge, and, and we'll stay for a little while after. If you'd like to come up and speak with him in person, please do so. But thank you so much for being with us here today. Oh, you're going to talk and, about your event and tonight. And come for the render rendering of my, oh, who asked me what language is here? Yeah, you. <laughs> this correction is in Ikoyo. It's also in Italian. It's also in English. So, All together in one book. Yes. Then it's poems. <laughs> so come here yeah, this evening. And that's this um, evening. That's um, your event tonight. Is it? Both for sometimes seven to eight. Seven to eight. Yeah. Do they need to go online to reserve? I can't remember. I think it's sold out, but it might be some six uh, uh, at the door. Yeah. Okay, that's tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gogay, for being with us okay, today. Okay, thank you.